It's going down to the wire in Israel. The ballots have closed. Exit polls, though, show a neck and neck, neck battle with a slight advantage for the incumbent Benjamin Netanyahu. But can he convert that edge into numbers? All eyes are now on the election results. Partial results, with 80% of the vote counted, show that Netanyahu's Likud party with 38 seats is at least eight more than the previous election in 2015. His main challenger, meanwhile, that's Benny Gantz. His centrist blue and white party has claimed 36. Remember, these are just exit poll numbers. But the Israeli prime minister and Gantz both have demanded that the president, Reuven Rivlin, give them the opportunity to form a governing coalition. Now, Gantz's statement was based on an exit poll on Israel's highest rated television station, which showed that he has won 37 seats, while Netanyahu lagged behind with 33. It's a historic event, actually. It never happened in Israel before. And we take it from here. It's just the first night. We see the real results. I'm sure and confident that we can do it. We we'll continue. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, Netanyahu too has claimed that the overall number of seats won by his right-wing bloc was larger. He's based his statement on the results of two other major television stations' exit polls, which showed that Netanyahu and Gantz's parties were tied and that the right-wing bloc had won 8 to 12 seats more than the left-centrist bloc. <laughs> אני מאוד נרגש שעם ישראל שוב נתן בי אמון בפעם החמישית ועוד אמון גדול יותר. אני מתכוון לסיים את המלאכה במהרה במטרה להקים ממשלה לאומית יציבה. Remember, no single party has ever won a ruling majority in parliament in an election in Israel. This suggests that hectic coalition building negotiations may lie ahead, a process that could take weeks. Once the results are out, the Israeli president will ask political parties that have won seats as to which candidate they support for the prime minister's post. He will then pick a party leader to try to form a coalition, giving the candidate 28 days to do so, and a further two-week extension could be granted if needed. So that adds up to a total of 42 days. The elections have widely been seen as a referendum on incumbent Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the leader who is battling for his political survival. He faces possible indictment in three corruption cases in which the right-wing leader has denied any wrongdoing. Right, so let's uh, talk a little bit more about that election with our uh, colleagues and, of course, our special guest this morning. First up, let me introduce all of them to you. Our West Asia Bureau Chief, Daniel Ipagani, is joining us live from a very cold Jerusalem. It's about 9 degrees Celsius there. He has the latest updates. Also with me, of course, is uh, former Indian ambassador to the U.S., Arun Singh. He joins us live from New Delhi. Also in the uh, studio with us is uh, my colleague, we on senior editor, Ramesh Ramachandran. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you all for making time with us here on the broadcast. Daniele, to you first. What's the word on the street? Netanyahu is claiming he has victory. Benny Gantz has said that as well. But uh, is it really all going to come down to the numbers and who can cobble together a formidable coalition? Good morning to you and good morning to all our guests and viewers. So let's start just very quickly with a few numbers. The Election Committee of Israel they shared the number of voters. Nearly 4 million uh, voted counted out of 6.3 million. And we are having a difference of 14,000 votes in favor of the Likud party. So this shows how a neck-to-neck -neck race this is. So as of now, the Likud is leading, but 15,000 votes, it's nothing. And we still have 1.4 million 
million votes to count. So things can change very quickly, even though it is all set, it seems for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to be at least requested by the President of Israel, Yivlin, to form a coalition, to propose a coalition, to see if he has the number. In terms of coalition of right-wing parties, the majority is with the Likud. His traditional and all the lies of the right-wing are ready to join hands with Netanyahu. So in terms of absolute numbers and absolute majority of the coalition, it seems that Israel will have another right-wing government led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. But as I said, the race is very, very close and the battle is still somehow open. The first takeaway is that Benny Gantz did put up a very, very tough fight. He did manage to actually put the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a very tough spot. Over to you. All right. So uh, a tough fight from Benny Gantz. Uh, Ambassador Singh, um, for many, you know, uh, Netanyahu appears to be the cat with nine lives. He's faced uh, many charges in the past. He's fighting this election with some very serious corruption and graft charges against him. But uh, we saw him coming out and reaching out to voters, telling them that uh, the right was in danger, that he was the right man to lead Israel for a fifth premiership. Do you think he's managed to perhaps uh, convert just a simple uh, support into something that is going to be a much more, uh, uh, you know, a, a something that can be counted in the form of cobbling together a coalition? Uh, whatever be the eventual outcome, as of now, Netanyahu can certainly claim a moral victory. I mean, there have been charges of corruption, there have been charges of fraud, and there was an issue whether he would be invited after the elections. And we have to see how that process plays out. But that having been said, he's got more seats for Likud party, his party, than was in the earlier Knesset. At that time, there are 30. Now the projections are that it may be 37, it may be more. So he has gained seats rather than uh, going down on the numbers in terms of anti-incumbency. The right-wing parties who are likely to align with Likud, they also seem to have sufficient numbers at this stage so that the Likud coalition will emerge uh, as the majority party. So to that extent, he can certainly claim a moral victory. On the other side, however, in the earlier uh, Knesset, the second largest party, Labour, had only 20 seats. This time, with the party led by Benny Gantz comes up with more than 30 seats, 35, 36, whatever is being talked of now, there will be a strong opposition present within the Knesset. And that's something that Netanyahu clearly will have to reckon with. Also, I think Netanyahu has been helped by the support that he seems to be getting from President Trump and the United States over the past several years. Because one of the things that defines voting in Israel, beyond just the issue of jobs or economy, is the question of how is Israel faring in terms of security, in terms of what is talked about as a peace process with the Palestinians. And there, several of the U.S. decisions have helped Netanyahu. President Trump walked out of the joint comprehensive plan of action with Iran. And that is something that Netanyahu and uh, Israel had asked for. President Trump moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And again, that is something that President Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu had been asking for. Right. And recently, he recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golden Heights, which again is a very, very major step. And uh, just a couple of days ago, he designated the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization. And Prime Minister Netanyahu tweeted thanking President Trump for accepting one of his uh, suggestions and requests. So from the U.S., from President Trump, he has received constant support. And therefore, in the minds of the Israeli population, there would certainly be an impression that in terms of security, in terms of advancing what they see as Israel's interest, in terms of advancing support from President Trump, uh, from the United States, perhaps Netanyahu is the best place. And in a sense, that is, of course, ironic because the other party led by Benny Gantz has three former highly respected the chiefs of the Israeli Defense Forces. There's Gabi Ashkenazi, there's Moshe Yalon, and of course, Benny Gantz himself. So, so they also deliberately came together to project that it is not just Netanyahu, but the alternative also can provide the required security for Israel. All because right. it, it has also been said that in the Israeli Defense Forces, some of the hardline uh, politics that Prime Minister Netanyahu has been talking about, there is a bit of concern whether that is sustainable in a longer term context. Right. But certainly the message that Prime Minister Netanyahu brought to the table seems to have got support from the Israeli people.
Indeed, and uh, let me go to Daniele on that very quickly. Dan, in fact, uh, some of the people that you were speaking with yesterday said, you know, they were highly undecided on who they're going to uh, eventually cast their ballot uh, in favor of. They said that they're probably going to make a split-second decision before they actually, uh, you know, slip their blue envelope into a blue box. Uh, does that go to say, in many ways, uh, going by the numbers we're looking at, that it really comes down to, you know, traditional support bases and uh, the sort of uh, larger-than-life, uh, perhaps, but personality that uh, Netanyahu has enjoyed in Israel uh, during his many stints as Prime Minister. Yes, I think so. I think that at the end of the day, was what uh, um, contributed to, to make up many Israelis' mind was uh, stability, the capability of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of guaranteeing a no chaos policy, and uh, at the end of the day, a good and roaring economy and an overall safe Israel. Yes, there are continuous clashes and escalations in and around the Gaza Strip, but at the end of the day, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has managed not to bring the country at the brink of war. Also, he managed very well in terms of what Israeli thinks of the crisis against Iran. Uh, his policy has been very clear and he has been managing a very balanced relation with Russia too. So I would say that stability and, uh, so to say, the known devil was what at the end of the voting day helped the many Israelis to make up their mind and rather prefer to vote for a person whom they know, a prime minister whom they know rather than, uh, so to say, newcomers. Benny is new to the political arena. Yes, he's not a um, private person. He has been within the arena of the Israeli high establishment. He's been former chief of staff. He spent the entire life in the army, but not necessarily being an army chief makes a good civilian leader, so there is no guarantee of that. And the last time that Israel had a former chief of staff, uh, of, of staff I'm talking about Barak, as a prime minister, things didn't really go down well and the population of Israel does not want that to happen again. So I think that stability, international respectability and, so to say, the law of the known devil helped the Israelis to make up their mind at the end of the day yesterday. Fair enough. Uh... Let me go across to Ramesh. Before I do, I also want to uh, welcome uh, one more guest to our show. Amichai Stein is joining us uh, on the broadcast. Uh, he's the diplomatic correspondent for Israel Can TV, joining us live from uh, Jerusalem. Uh, to him in just a second. First up, Ramesh, uh, you know, we've already spoken about the Trump-US factor, but there is also the Russia factor to look at. And it seems that Netanyahu has been able to play a very, very smart balancing game between these uh, two world powers, between the US and Russia. Russia. Uh, do you think that has also held him in good stead uh, ahead of the elections? Indeed, I shut, uh, and as, as we've been reporting here on Beyond World is One, Netanyahu has made frantic visits to major capitals around the world in the run-up to the election, including, as you mentioned, Russia and the U.S., and they've been, they played a major part in, in his election campaign, so to speak. Remember, Trump uh, has literally you know, in sort of made concessions to Netanyahu and agreed to, for instance, uh, treat uh, Golan Heights as Israeli territory to accept and, you know, and recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and shift the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So, and also is focused uh, on Iran and including imposed sanctions and pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal in 2018 May. So clearly, Trump has had a hand to play in Netanyahu's election campaign, no doubt. But just very quickly, coming back to the election counting as we speak, Aisha, it's been less than eight hours since the election, the il polling actually stopped. And one can make five or six informed uh, inferences, so to speak. Now, three, almost all of the exit polls have uh, proved wrong. One gave Gans a majority, so to speak, in the, in the exit polls. The other three, channels 11, 12, and 13, put it neck and neck, but in favor of Gans. Now, as results are coming in as we speak, 80% votes have been counted, and Netanyahu is clearly ahead of the pack, but only so much. Second point, the single largest party may still be not be able to form the government because coalitions are the order of the day. No single party has ever won a majority of the seats since uh, 1969 when one party won 56 seats. So clearly, coalitions would be the thing to watch out for. Number three, it's clear as, as daylight that Labour Party is dead, is virtually with its back against the wall. Number four, the Arab voting percentage has gone down as compared to 2015 elections. 
and the fact that the voter turnout this year was comparatively low, generally speaking, would be a matter of concern for almost all parties, including the ruling Likud party. And this bank campaign has been very bitter, very, very, uh, you, know, you know, laced with innuendos. Gans's mobile phone being hacked was in the news for a long, a long period of time. Netanyahu in 2015 raised the specter of Arab you know, Arab uh, voting en masse by talking about Arabs coming in buses in droves. This year there was a controversy around uh, body cameras being fitted on the Klikut supporters and election watchers to keep a tab on the Arab voters in particular. Yes. And that triggered the uh, acquisitions of voter intimidation. Now, and last point, if, if as the results show, which is still coming in as we speak, if Likud party is leading at 37 seats, Aisha, this is a better performance than 2015 when Likud won 30 seats. So clearly, 10 years of Netanyahu rule does not seem to have gone against him. There is no anti-incumbency, as we in India call it, at play here. And the fact that his coalition ally, the new, the new right party, is completely marginalized and out of the picture also tells a different story. All right, you've got given us quite a bit to chew on, Ramesh, and uh, especially that comment about exit polls. There's another similarity between India and Israel that exit polls definitely can't be trusted. Uh, let me go across to Mr. Stein on that note. Uh, Mr. Stein, I'm sure you heard my colleague Ramesh Ramachandran break down many key elements of uh, this uh, election. All right, I'm giving uh, to understand that uh, Mr. Stein is going to join us back in a second. Uh, let me go across to uh, Ambassador Singh on that note. Uh, Ambassador Singh, you know, uh, there was a mention from Benny Gantz uh, talking about the idea of uh, Netanyahu coming back to power. He called it a danger to Israel's democracy, the fact that power is going to be vested in the same person again. Let's not forget that this is going to be uh, the fifth term for uh, Netanyahu if he does manage to, uh, you know, uh, claim victory in this uh, election. But does this, uh, you know, the exit polls at least demonstrate that that really isn't a big fear in uh, Israel and, of course, keeping in mind that uh, Arab voters haven't really come out in big droves? Uh, some could argue that there is a threat uh, to democracy for two reasons. One, of course, as Benny Gatz has suggested, that if you have one very, very strong leader, somebody now uh, being looking at being prime minister for more than 15 years, clearly he would tend to dominate Israeli politics. And that for those who want a more a wider spread of power would be an area of concern. But I think the bigger concern is that the way uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the increasingly right word shift in Israeli politics has been driving Israeli policy is towards integrating uh, now the Golan Heights, large parts of the West Bank into Israel. Now, what that would mean is that the Jewish majority in Israel may not hold in the same way as it has done. So if Israel works gradually towards not a two-state, but a one-state solution, then the population of Palestinians and the Arab people in what would be under Israeli control would be broadly similar to the population of the Jewish people. Now, if you don't have a majority that is clearly Jewish, then how can you have a Jewish state and a democratic state? So these are some of the concerns that people have been uh, raising that the best option for Israel to have a Jewish and a democratic state is to have a two-state solution. Okay. But the way politics is being driven in Israel at the moment is away from the fact of a two-state solution. And that will certainly cause concern. All right. Uh, let me take that to Daniele. Daniele, um, you know, very clearly, uh, Mr. Netanyahu has placed emphasis on his idea of the Israeli state as being a Jewish state, that it is uh, more or less the same thing, that, you know, the two ideas are aligned with one another. Given what the ambassador has just mentioned, though, um, does that seem like a short-term goal for uh, the Israeli uh, prime minister, looking clearly at this election alone, but not understanding the sort of uh, demographic changes uh, that might take place when you know he, he decides to pursue with his plan of expanding Israeli settlements and uh, you know recognizing further uh, the, the extent of uh, the Israel state and rejecting the two-state solution. 
Well, uh, when it comes uh, to um, the Israeli settlements uh, and expanding the Israeli settlements, I must say that the last electoral promise, the big last-minute electoral promise that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made, according to me, to my personal perception, was just a call on to voters. It was just courting uh, those on the right wing who were not still decided. Annexing uh, the large settlements, uh, which, no, which as of now lies within the West Bank, so within the Palestinian territories, uh, is way easier said than done. We are talking about half a million possibly people living in East Jerusalem and in this settlement, and we are talking about eventually a military possibility and a military solution in order to do that. This is not something which is going to happen overnight, and this is not something which is actually going to happen. I think that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu believes that this might be a possibility in the future, but I don't think that he sees these actually being implemented during a legislation. I see that as a very big electoral uh, um, promise, uh, which was made in order to court the undecided right-wingers uh, in order to request them to vote for him and to tell them, look, I am still on your side when it comes to expanding Israel as much as possible. Uh, many things are always said during campaigning, not all those many things, many things will actually happen. The relations between the Palestinians and the Israeli, both under Prime Minister Netanyahu and eventually had Benny Gantz win, would have not changed that much. They did share a very, very similar idea. And the idea of foreseeing a Palestinian independent nation for both of them was actually not really on the table. Okay, so um, we'll say thanks to you Daniele for now uh, we will reach out to you again through the day for more updates from the Israeli election from the results so to speak um, I'll also thank my other guests on that note uh, Ambassador Arun Singh and Weon's uh, senior editor Ramesh Ramachandran as we mentioned earlier it is a hung verdict as of now results are still being counted or rather votes are still being counted in Israel but what has emerged quite clearly is that uh, although there's been a very spirited fight from the new kid on the block that that is uh, Benny Gantz uh, to the incumbent Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu has emerged uh, from exit poll numbers at least with a stronger number of seats than last time around. So has Israel in many ways vested its hopes in the four-time Prime Minister once again despite the corruption charges, despite the fact that there has been the accusations that he's gone soft on uh, national security? It seems that Benjamin Netanyahu still seems to hold the attention of the Israeli people. What exactly will that mean for West Asia at large, for other countries like the United States, Russia, the situation in Syria and, of course, with Iran? Let's not forget India as well. Remember, under Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Netanyahu, the ties between these two countries have flourished, so to speak. Will that continue in the same vein, despite... Uh, a continuance in power in Israel or will the situation change if another Benjamin comes to claim that post?